All right, we're ready to go live. Welcome to our show on Sunday to a standard array. Um, we are live here Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, and we're going to go ahead and get started. But you might notice right away that we're missing one of our hosts, uh, our co-host, PB Plays Inside. Uh, she is having technical difficulties with a uh, streaming PC that has decided to no longer function so uh, she's working on that as hard as she can um, it's something that we're gonna have to take a look at it might take a little bit for her to get back online with us and uh, but we didn't want the show not to go we want to make sure that we were out here and still talking to all the fans and you know putting out good content for people here on a Sunday night so if you are here watching it with us live, that's great, over on the Solution uh, Twitch channel. If not, you check out the VOD, welcome uh, whatever day you happen to be watching this on, or if you happen to see it on YouTube, welcome any of the YouTube subscribers or viewers out there that are watching it there too. Uh, definitely hit that subscribe and like buttons on all of the different video formats that you're watching it. And let's go ahead and get started. So I'm Sir Lucian with Sir Lucian Gaming. And normally I have my co-host PB Plays Inside. And we talk about lots of RPG subjects. Um, a lot of times there's a lot of uh, Dungeons & Dragons shows out there. There's a lot of other RPG shows out there. And we wanted to kind of cover some of the other stuff. Or maybe some more of the system agnostic discussions. Or things that you could use in any system. And that's kind of where uh, the standard array had, had, had come from. So... What is going on? So let's talk about our, uh, our schedule. Uh, right now we're on at 9 p.m. We usually go for about an hour, uh, although we may switch to a couple of different days at some point or different times just to try out to see where the audience uh, kind of feels like the show really fits. Uh, I think for the next month or two we'll stay in the Sunday slot and then we might try to switch it and maybe try maybe a Friday slot or some other day slot where me and PB uh, can schedule it and see if you know how the audience reacts to that um, and if you want to ever give us uh, any suggestions for shows or topics you'd like us to talk about you can go ahead and reach us at at standard array uh, and that's the show twitter account and you can send us uh, information there or questions and we are always checking that almost constantly but you can also send it to either at PB Plays Inside or at Solution Gaming, and we both get those as our own uh, Twitter accounts. And you can also send us information, or mostly we're looking for like you know things that you guys would be interested in, or things that we could cover um, in in one of our shows, because we're gonna have a lot of them. If we run it every week, that's about 52 a year, so we're gonna have to have a lot of topics. So you guys can help us out with that. Um, also, every now and then we're going to bring in guests, and we might do guest hosts, we might do guest interviews. In fact, if you were to look at our episode, I want to say two, yeah, I think it was episode two, we did a uh, interview with um, Chris Locke from, uh, also known as at uh, Snickle Socks, from the creating the uh, 5e kind of game called uh, Retroverse or uh, Lasers and Liches is the thing that you can look up. So you can go back and check that out if you haven't done that yet. Um, so that's one of the other shows that we've done. So we'll do a little bit, we'll do some things like that. We'll play around with the format a little bit and we'll just see how it goes. But tonight we're just going to talk about it. You guys get me tonight. And so I thought I would cover something that I've been meaning to make a video on and I might just use this as the video, although I may do more of an edited video, uh, maybe for YouTube later on. But tonight's topic I really wanted to talk about was running games at conventions. Uh, there's a lot of conventions that are coming up. Uh, in fact, I just signed up for Gen Con, which is what was making me think about it. And I want to be able to run some games at Gen Con. And so I thought I've done it for a couple of years now, and I thought maybe I would share some of the information or some of the things that you might want to know if you're planning on maybe running a game. Now there's other videos out there you can find and I definitely recommend you do that. Uh, there's a lot of good information. There's a lot of people that um, try to help out people that are going. But if you're going to volunteer and you're kind of worried or you're not sure how it's going to work or what to do or what to think about it, maybe this will help you um, be a little bit more confident about it. And uh, these are from my experiences and so you know your mileage may vary as, as they mostly say. Um, but hopefully I can help you out. So let's jump in. 
And I'll kind of keep an eye on uh, chat over here. So if you see me looking away every now and then, that'll just be me keeping an eye on chat as I kind of run the show. And we, uh, we kind of work it with just uh, one person. So we'll see how this goes. All right. So a year ago at Gen Con, I signed up to run uh, tabletop role-playing games. And that's what this is going to cover. Um, how to run a tabletop role-playing game at a convention. And a lot of the information I'm going to provide comes from my experience with working with a really good company, which was Magpie Gaming. Uh, they are the ones that have several Powered by the Apocalypse type games. And when I signed up with them, they asked me to run a few different games. So when I signed up, I was able to run, I want to say, four different Mass The Next Generation games. I ran, I want to say, two Undying games, which is kind of like a Powered by the Apocalypse vampire style game. And I believe I ran one or two, I think it was two um, Urban Shadows games, another Powered by the Apocalypse games. All games that you can find out on the Magpie Randoms, or um, Magpie Gaming. I get that there's there's two people I work with that have the Magpie in their name. Uh, Ma Magpie Gaming uh, Company, and they put out those RPGs. Um, in fact, Brandon Conway was the one that I worked with and, and was my contact when I kind of signed up for that. So... Let's talk about convention games, right? Because maybe you're used to running games at a table with your friends, or maybe you run them at a game store, um, or maybe you run them online. And those are all fun and awesome type games to run. Um, and that'll help you with if you're going to run at a convention game. It doesn't mean that you have to do those things. You, it, a convention game can be the very first time you've ever uh, run a game. It can be you know, the hundredth time you ran a game. Um, either way, it doesn't matter because you're going to prepare for it. And you're going to be ready, and um, usually you'll be you'll be given a lot of material um, if you're working with, say, a company, or you're working with. Um, there's a lot of different types of people that uh, purchase tables at conventions, and then they ask GMs to run games that are from their either stockpile of games that they have, or maybe they have a certain theme that they want to do, or maybe they're a gaming group and they're hosting a bunch of D&D 5e games, or maybe they're hosting Stars Without Numbers, or maybe they're hosting you know, Dungeon World, or whatever it might be, and they're looking for volunteers, and you decide to volunteer to run it as a GM, a lot of times they're going to provide you with uh, plenty of the material that you might need. But uh, there's other times where you might just sign up at a convention, and they allow you to just run a game. You can sponsor it yourself. You can tell them what kind of game you're going to run, and it's just up to you to kind of create the materials, create the story, uh, create the adventure that you're going to run, and, and have all the stuff that you're going to need. As an example, I'm going to do that at uh, Marmalade Dog, which is a uh, convention that's coming up here uh, pretty soon near my neck of the woods, and I volunteered to run a mass, the generation, next generation game there uh, for whoever shows up and signs up for the game. So... What ends up happening, um, some things to keep in mind, right? So convention games, when you're thinking about convention games, most of the time, a convention game is going to be one where you're going to present what game you're going to play. You're going to specify what time slot it is, when it is. And then random people, for the most part, maybe somebody you know, but normally random people are going to sign up and join the game. So you're really developing or playing a game that is meant to be played with probably people you don't know. So keep that in mind, okay? So that's one thing to kind of be prepared for. And that's probably one thing that's scary for a lot of people that are brand new to, to GM or DM, whatever you want to, uh, or MC. There's lots of different variations on, you know, um, Dungeon Master, Game Master, Master of Ceremonies, that kind of thing. And when you're going to play with people you don't know, a lot of anxiety can happen, or a lot of fear, but you, don't worry about it. Um, the thing that I noticed, because I had it when I volunteered for my games, was the people that come to the tables are there because they want to have fun. Um, they want to learn about the game. They want to play this cool game that you're offering to play or, or run for them. And normally they're probably people who may or may not be getting a lot of gaming any other time, 
So they're really invested in having a good time. They're not there to criticize. They're not there to judge you. They're not there to tell you you're doing it wrong because this is their chance to get into a game that they've either heard of and they want to try, or it's a game they played once before and they want to play it again, or maybe it's a game they love and they just want to play it with more people. That's why they're there. And knowing that your players are there for that reason can help alleviate a lot of that anxiety. They're going to help you make a successful game, right? And you can set that tone right when you get to the table of, hey, I'm new to this too, or I'm here to make a really fun game, but I really need your guys' help to help me make this a, a great experience, all right? So if there's things that you see or things that you want to do that are going to help out, let them, you know, let them help you make a good game. It's not just about you making a good game for them. It's about all of you coming together and making a good game. So hopefully that helps with any anxiety you might have. Now, when you sign up for a game, so let's take um, let's take our mass the the new generation here. So I've got my book, right? I got that. I bought that. Um, actually, I got this from uh, Brandon. Okay, so you can see uh, Brendan Conway is the uh, the author, although you probably can't see it too well there. He signed it for me, which was super cool. And I got this book. I bought the PDF on Drive Through RPG because when I volunteered, I said, "Okay, I need to learn how to play the game." I volunteered to run a game I'd never played. Okay, you can do it too. So hopefully, we help you with that tonight. So um, when I ran those games, and you know, I, I, I had some anxiety about it. I, I did my homework. I did my research. I prepped for it. And the games went fantastic. All of the players that showed up were wonderful. I made some friends out of it. And I got to meet Brandon, which was really cool. Really good guys and uh, uh, Magpie Gaming. And because I ran the games, they gave me a book and I got it signed. So it was really cool to work with them. So that's just a cool little thing. So when I signed up, um, Brandon sent to me kind of a prep to say, hey, if you're going to be running a game, you're going to be running a mass games, here's the things you should keep in mind. Now, what I liked about it was when you're working with somebody who's hosting games, right? So you've signed up with somebody who's asked for volunteers. They're not normally just going to leave you hanging out there to come up with all your own stuff. A lot of times to help you be successful, they're going to go ahead and give you material that you need. Okay, so as an example, I wanted to show you something. Let me go over here and let's switch over to, let's go to this just for a second. It may be hard to read and um, I do apologize for that. I don't know, we might be able to zoom in a little more. Let's see if we go to view, zoom, uh, would 200 be too much? Oh, we might already be at, at that. There we go. So it's a little bit bigger. So this is an example of what they sent. So he had sent to us and said, hey, we're running a couple of these events. One of them is called uh, The Return of the Farlander. And they give you a, a neat little synopsis. Little, This is the thing that, was, that people read when they signed up. They offered, hey, here's the materials you're going to need. And they, they provided those PDFs for us to be able to prep before the game. They talk a little bit about the scenario. But look, it's not a very big paragraph. It's just a little bit. And then they give you these really good tips for GMs, right? So there's really good, hey, you probably want to read the preface just so you have a good idea. Um, you want to read a little bit about the basics, a little bit about the heroes, a little bit about the moves. It's not necessarily reading the whole book, but it's definitely targeted to the pieces that you're going to be um, needing for the game. And then it just says, look over these ones. And if you really want to, you can find these other things out on YouTube. You can watch, uh, for inspiration, different uh, cartoons and shows that are out there that have to do with young superheroes, for our example here. And then they give you some things to, to really be prepared for. And these things are probably mostly targeted for this game or like a Powered by the Apocalypse style game. But you want to have a couple of bullet points like these if you're running any game. So hopefully they provide that kind of thing to you when you sign up. We'll talk about if they don't, because if they don't, then what you're going to do is you're going to go through and make these for yourself so that you know for your game. And that, that'll be similar to what I do for my Marmalade Dog game. Okay. So 
be prepared, you know, so when they were talking about what, what are the things that I'm going to have to do at the table, you know, they're going to be creating characters from scratch. Oh, okay, that's, a, that's an important thing to know in a, um, in a game. Now, these games that we sign up for, now, a lot of conventions are using kind of a very similar format. And in that format, a lot of times the games are going to be probably about four-hour slots. Okay, so you're really needing to play your game, plan your game out for four hours. And depending on what your game is, is going to depend on how many different scenes you need, how much plot they might possibly get through, because you can only get through so many combat scenarios, you can only get through so many RP scenarios, you can only get through so much introduction stuff to fit in four hours, right? And so you're gonna kind of map out a little bit of that stuff. Now, what I have found is convention style games are going to be a little bit more on the rails than other games. It doesn't mean that every game will be, and it doesn't mean that you have to be solidly on the rails. You can put some deviation there, you can put a little bit of wiggle room, but from what I have noticed so far, a lot of it is structured because you know you only have a certain time slot and you're only going to get to play with those people probably the one time. Um, and so there's not going to be a lot of continuity that you have to worry about from session to session to session. Okay, That's not always true. Now, I have seen um, some Gen Con ones where you can take session one and then you can go to session two and then you can go to session three and those are all four-hour chunks and they all are this is the first part, this is the middle part, and this is the end part, and you want to be in all of them, like Adventure League stuff and that kind of thing, which is, that's fine. If that's the thing that you're going to be um, creating, then all you're worrying about it for the ones you're running is those segments that you're pre preparing for those segments the, for what you need, okay? Most games are going to be one-offs, random people, four hours long, somewhere in there, right about four hours, and you probably won't have to worry about any continuity after that, okay? So that's how you're going to kind of think about your session. That's how you're going to plan for your session a little bit. You want to be on the rails some with a little bit of lead way to allow each game to be a little bit different from the other one, okay? Now, with Mass, we'll use this as an example really quick. It was very easy to do that because in Mass, here's a big thing you need to know when you're going to run a game. Are we going to be creating characters at the table? Or are characters already going to be prepared before we get there? Okay. So um, this game, let's use uh, Mass just for a second, or any kind of Powered by Apocalypse game. Um, in that session, you typically will be building your characters right from the when everybody sits down at the table. So what's nice about that is you're going to plan out part of your time to create characters, right? And in Mass, it talks about when you create your characters, that's where you're building your scenario for what you're going to do um, in the session. You're listening to things that the characters are coming up. You're letting them help build the, uh, the setting and some of the things that are in it. And then you're going to take those little pieces and you're going to use them to build some scenes for them, for them to have a really good time. So like it says here, where it says, be prepared to let them create characters from scratch. Creating characters is part of the fun of mass. Plan on character creation taking approximately one to one and a half hours. So that's a big key there. Okay, so that gives you an idea of saying, okay, uh, I have an idea of how long I want to take. I want to keep an eye on the time as I'm going. I want to know character creation enough that I can explain it to brand new people in an hour, an hour and a half. Okay, of my four-hour slot, I want to make sure that I can do that. So that's an important thing to understand, right? Um, if you're going to be running a game where they bring the characters, they're already going to be sitting down and ready to play, then you're not going to need, you're, you're going to have four hours of adventure versus an hour of character creation and then three hours of adventure, right? So you can plan appropriately depending on what type of game you've signed up for. Now, another thing to keep in mind is, um, is that the type of people that you're going to have at your table. You're probably going to have a mix of people that sit down and play as far as varying levels of experience with RPGs. Um, from the games that I ran, 
it was a wide range of people from people who had barely played any RPGs at all. They might have been, I think I even had some people that that was their very first game. They had been going to Gen Cons and they were playing board games, which they really liked, but they finally decided they saw this uh, mass, they thought it was neat, they, they liked the way it read, and they wanted to sit down and play it, and they'd never even played a role playing game before. They'd only played board games and such. All the way from people that had loved Mass, had played Mass, owned Mass, ran the game as a GM for their group for many months, came and sat down at the table wanted to play. So you have all this big range there. But you should structure your session for those that are newer. Okay, Those that don't know the rules, those that have never played this game, and may, maybe not even played any game, right? And then you can adjust if you see that you have a party or a, a group of people around the table that are a little bit more experienced. You can adjust on the fly moving up into saying, okay, I can move quicker. I don't have to explain as many things. We can go on. That's always an easy adjustment. It's a hard adjustment to go, oh, I'm just going to assume they're experienced, get uh, an hour into the session and realize, wait a minute, they don't know how to, they've never played an RPG. Now I've got to slow it down. You've already lost the game at that point. Okay, So start it as if nobody there has played this game before and you're teaching them how to play and you're all going to have fun doing it. Right? Explain that in the beginning and then judge if you can, can speed up things or not explain things depending on who you have at the table. And you can ask. When people are sitting down before the session, get to know your players a little bit. Right? Talk to them a little bit before things are going on. Ask them about what games they like to play, how things are going at the convention for them, why they decided to choose this one, what, what was it about this one that they really liked. Get some info that's helping you kind of decide, okay, what kind of game do I need to run? How fast of a pace do I need to go? How much explaining do I need to do as we move through the system? And that's really what this one talks about. So this one is, uh, I like this too, where it says, at the start of play, put out the Farlander, Seismic Prime, Rampage, Aquaria, and the Photovore onto the table. These are cards that have the villains that come from Halcyon City and Masks. And it says, tell each PC, so anyway, all the players that were playing, that they have to somehow tie their backstory into at least one of these villains, right? This starts to help get things connected. And, you know, it let them time into more than one, let them time into each other, and those things. And as we can see, that way they'll be connected. Here it talks about, you know, let them define how their team came together, start the game with a big fight scene, featuring an alien-controlled rampage. And this is all about, you know, this is suggestion, this is guidelines, but they usually trust you to, to tweak it a little bit if you feel like you need to. I kind of followed the, the thing here. But... As you can tell, there's not a ton of script here. There's just enough to get you going, and then you can kind of plan out as you go in your session, or you can plan out the details yourself to fit the type of game that you want to present. So this was a nice little um, document that Magpie Games sent. So I, I just thought it was a really cool thing. And for when I run games, this is kind of the template that I'm going to use to fill out if I'm going to run a game, because if I have this information, if I have my catchy, what is this session about? If I have uh, links to where my rules are, if I talk about a little bit about the basic scenario so I know what's going on, what pages are going to be relevant to me to look at before I go into the game, maybe some uh, YouTube videos that I could watch of people playing the game just to get a feel for how the game um, flow goes, how mechanics are done, how dice rolling is done. Um, how to set tone, how to set pacing. I can see how other people do it, and then I can make my decision on how I want to do it, you know, some and some relevant stuff, and then I can follow into this this information. So I really did like that. Um, let's go back to. Uh, so I really did like the idea that you can have a document that kind of steps out a little bit of it. And again, it feels like it's a little bit on rails, but there's there was room for things to happen. Now, I ran this scenario uh, two times, and it was wildly different depending on the groups because the groups tied themselves to different villains, and the way they went about or the way I described certain things happening, they did different things, and so the sessions were very different. So it was really a really fun thing to do. So things to keep in mind is what we're talking about. Um, 
the players that you're playing with, you know, the time slot that you have, how long does it take? If you're running a game and one thing that you want to be aware of is how long certain things happen. So like if you do an RP scene, an RP scene between a couple of characters that you set up, maybe it's you're asking them about, hey, tell me about when you're sitting around the campfire and what you're doing or how you're setting camp up. Or maybe it's about, hey, you guys are back at the, the superhero base and sh what do you do when that happens? Or you're at school and you get the, how are you contacted that there's a, you know, a disaster happening? Those types of things, you, you can kind of plan on being anywhere from a 10 minute kind of thing, depending on how, you know, forthcoming and, and engaged your players are, can all the way go up to a, a 20 minute to even maybe a 30 minute scene, right? And then you can get into combat, and combat, depending on what game you're playing, can be certain lengths of time. And you can kind of control that depending on how many creatures you put into it, how many bad guys, you know, how many players you have at the table. Those are all going to be little itty-bitty factors that if you have a good idea about the system and how it runs, you can kind of plan ahead. And to have a couple of things ready to go and use those as you need them. Kind of plug them in. Make it very modular when you set this up, right? Um... Convention games, for me, come down to a lot of times that you're teaching people or showing people the game that you're presenting. So you want to show them the quintessential game that they're playing. If they're playing Masks, though in a home campaign, I may take it in a different route. I may go in a darker area. I may go uh, more sci-fi. I may go off-planet. I may do whatever. In a convention game with a mass game, I'm going to play the, the very quintessential session that explains mass the best as it can, right? I want them to know that when they left, they played a mass game and, and, it's, and it sat in their head as, oh my, okay, that's what it is. I love it. Now I'm going to go out and buy it or now I'm going to go find some friends to play it. And I really like this. And you want to make sure that you frame it. If it was a Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition game, quintessential D&D 5e game at a certain level, right? Or maybe it's a Pathfinder game, or maybe it's another uh, Dungeon World game. Maybe it's a Powered by the Apocalypse, or any of the games that are out there. Star Trek Adventures, uh, Numenera, all these different games. Make sure you target the game you're playing in such a way that you're showing them exactly what this game is about as read, right? They can get very creative and take the rules and take the setting in a different direction, but you're showing them what it is in the book, what it is in the rule set, what it is the designers had, had really wanted the game to be for themselves, even though they say in here, you know, you can make your own world, you can do your own thing, but show them what that game is that you're presenting for them. Okay, so another thing that was very helpful, so one of the things that, so kind of back to having prepared materials. Um, having this little document that kind of stepped out some of the things I need to keep in mind for my session was really neat. At the table, what are some of the things you're going to need, right? So when you go to a convention game, not everybody is going to bring dice. Not everybody is going to bring a pencil. Not everybody, nobody's going to be character sheets for the most part. They're expecting you to have those things available, okay? So keep that in mind. Keep in mind that you want to have pre-printed character sheets, uh, or in this case, uh, these were playbooks that you want to have set for masks um, or whatever it might be. You probably want to have an array of pencils, um, or I we had pencils and pens. People would pick whatever they wanted. We had like a bag of them. So what, what was really nice is we had Ziploc bags, and in, in one Ziploc bag was um, pens and then three by five cards so that people could write their name on them and so their character name and put it in front of them which was really nice um, in Numenera when we did Numenera they built these really nice cards that were folded in half and on the front side you could write your name in nice big lettering and you could point that out to the rest of the people at the table so everybody could see everybody's name and on the back side of it the part that you could see sitting in front of you were the common rules that you might need to use while playing that was a very cool idea and a very high quality thing and something that I, I'm making for my games. 
Um, so you, that's something you could do, like these little things that, you know, basic moves or basic rules or, um, you know, those kinds of things sitting right there. Character sheets, pencils, pens, and as you know, uh, have that in your Ziploc bag. Some type of counters usually are needed. Like in mass, we use them for influence and uh, teamwork points and things like that. Um, and, and there's lots of other games that have some type of other economy that's going on. It might be fate points or it might be, um, uh, I'm trying to think of what some of the other names are. I'm forgetting them at the, off the top of my head at the moment. But having something that can be used as a counter was really nice. We had little um, glass beads, kind of, you know, just the almost look like stuff from uh, Magic the Gathering tokens that where people would use them to, to move off their life as they're playing the game. Those kinds of things. Those are always really nice. Or even dice could work for counters. Um, but anything like that that you have, like a nice little bag of those to have out on the table. For Undying, we needed them for blood because your uh, whatever blood you had as a vampire could power... Or, or generate certain powers by spending that blood. So they would gather that and keep that in front of them. So you want to have counters for that. So keep that in mind for your game that you're running. If it has some type of counters, you're going to want a bag of them because people are not going to be bringing them. Um, definitely make sure you have a way for everybody to put their name in front of each other. And it helps you to call out their name. Because in the session, you want to use the character name as much as possible um, to help promote you know, everybody role-playing at the, at the table, because that's really what everybody's there for. It's not about that everybody has to have voices or everybody has to have a fully fleshed-out character, but it is about let's try to use, um, you know, the names as much as we can and uh, have as real of a session as we can with people that might be random and have never played with each other before. Have your scenario. Uh, some games, you know, if you're going to have a, a, a Dungeon Master screen, that's okay. Not all games require that. Um, I didn't have one with masks or anything like that. I just sat in front of them. Uh, masks came with, which was really nice, if you can get them, um, had some cards. So they were like villain cards that you could use that could help. You could put out on the table and you could, they had their powers, uh, too much light probably. But they have their powers on the back and such. Um, really cool artwork to drive some of the things. So those are some things you could probably do or print out yourself um, and have ready. And those are things that you're going to want to bring to your table. Okay, um, Keep it all together. Uh, have everything kind of organized. Be ready. You want to be able to pick up stuff quickly. So make sure you have a little baggie and containers for those things. Because a lot of times what will happen when you're running a game is somebody will have your table in the next slot. So let's say you're the very first game of the morning, so you're slot number one, but then slot number two is gonna happen right after your game. There's usually not a really big gap, so you wanna be able to gather your stuff and move to the next table or go off and do whatever you need to do so that that person can set up at their table. Um, plan for your time slot. Most are gonna be four hours, but maybe some conventions will do it differently. Um, plan accordingly. Plan a little bit extra if you for in case the game goes pretty quickly now normally it won't normally you have a lot of you have brand new people at the table they're going to rp together they're going to have cool uh role play scenes and they're gonna uh, they're gonna be tentative they're gonna be cautious um and some of the scenes will take longer than you actually expect them to but having a few things to be able to throw in if things are going a little too quickly modular wise will help you fill in little gaps if you need to. Keep an eye on when you want to build to your climax and have a cool epic thing at the end of it. You know, build towards something that's gonna sit with them is, is gonna be that moment that they remember in the game. The moment they finally overcome the bad guy or the, the big bad guy finale or a really cool escape that really makes them think, oh, we almost had that person, but they just escaped. You know, that, that cool scene of um, these, this person might become their nemesis from now on, that kind of thing. All the games I ran, the players had such a good time. They were laughing. Um, they were working with each other by the end of the session. But definitely in the beginning of the session, they were all very tentative. They were all very, I don't know this person sitting next to me. I don't know the rules. I don't know, I don't know, I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to do something embarrassing. And a lot of 
that is going to fall on your shoulders to help them feel at ease, help them have a really good experience so that they connect playing this game that you've decided to play with an absolute fun time, right? You want that to be the best thing that you can do. Um, Because if they have that, they might go buy that game. They might then go and find their friends and play it. They might even decide to run it one day, all because you had created a really good experience for them at this convention. Now, all of my experiences have been great, and you can be a little prepared for things aren't quite going okay, right? So I was running several games, and I had to learn... Uh, for Magpie Gaming, I had never run Undying. I had never run Mass before. I had never run um, Urban Shadows. Okay, so I got the books. I got the PDFs. I went through the documents. They prepped me. I went and watched other people running them on YouTube. I did all the stuff because I was like, I didn't want to go and not represent the game effectively to people. I didn't want to be the reason that they thought, ah, uh, I don't like Mass. It wasn't very fun because I did it wrong, right? Because I wasn't able to make it a fun game. If they don't like masks or they don't like Undying or Urban Shadows or Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition, I want it to be because of something that it's just not their thing versus I didn't create a fun experience for them. Okay? So all of my games went really well. I had one where I think it was my Urban Shadows one, the first one I ran. I didn't realize or I missed one rule that kind of threw the game off a little bit, okay? The only lesson to take away from that, from what I felt like when I was done, um, I felt like I failed a little bit, but the players were all happy when they left. They all thought I had a really good time, and I explained to them that when I figured out that we had missed something, that, oh, we should have been doing this, but that's okay, that happens in a role-playing game, and they were all on board with it you're not going to get everything right and that's okay you know it's okay that if one thing went wrong or you didn't get a rule right that's just role playing games i've been playing uh dungeons and dragons 5th edition storm king's thunder i think we're on episode 55 now sessions we've been playing for a year and a half and i still to this day have to look up rules I still go back and look up the grappling rules every couple of sessions because I forget them. I still go back and I look up, well, how do you do concentration again when you take damage and what's the exact rule and the math? And that's okay. Do what every good DM video out there, DM advice video out there says. Just make a ruling at the table. Keep the game flow moving, even if you have to make a, a spot judgment. And then just say at the end of it, or even at the time, just say, I'm just going to rule it this way for now. We may find that when you go through the book, you find the rule that actually tells you what you should do. Then you should do that, or at your table, you guys can decide how how best to do it. But for here, for now, just to keep things running, we're going to do this, right? So don't beat yourself up so much if you make a mistake. Always, what I'd like to think of is fail forward. So even if you're failing in some way, Keep it moving forward. Keep it fun. Keep the game moving ahead. Um, Don't get so uh, trapped in your own head about, oh my God, I don't know the rule. We've got to stop everything until I look it up. Now I'm flustered. Don't don't do that. You know, just just make a ruling and move on. Okay. So that's one thing. Keep the game moving. Keep it fun. Make decisions that will make it a fun and enjoyable game. And then move on. And then just address it with the group at the end or even during the time and just say, hey, there may be a rule for this. Instead of looking it up right now, we just want to keep the action flowing. We're going to move right past it. We'll do something that sounds great. And then we'll keep going. Okay? Most players are going to be right in with you. Some of the players at the table might know what the rule is and help you out if you're letting them help you, if you're being honest with the group and you're keeping them involved and you're all there working together. Keep that in mind, right? Now, one other thing can happen in a game, and and this was the idea of what happens if we get to, or a player does something awkward, um, you see something's about to happen that could be awkward, or you see that you've done something that's made somebody else 
uncomfortable, right? So one of the things I learned um, early on, and it was one of the things that it was in my very first game, and I was talking to some of the players that were there, and they had mentioned it from another game, and, and even in Urban Shadows in the book, they talk about it. They talk about what's called the X card, and a lot of different people have a lot of different versions of this, but it's a nice little thing, however you do it, at the beginning of your session to say, hey, we're going to run a session, we're going to run a game, and in this game, there could be adult themes, right? There could be some things that we get into that we won't know until it starts to happen that might make somebody here uncomfortable. If that happens, you want to empower them to say, can we not do that? Can we kind of X out that whatever just happened? And can we move on without having to discuss it, right? It's not about you have to explain to me why you don't like so much violence in the game or you don't like the description of all of the blood or you don't like the description of something that's even more uncomfortable because it maybe it's of a uh, racial nature maybe it's of a um, some type of sexual nature in the game like in the undying vampire game it is a darker theme and you have to be careful because you're at a convention with people you don't know and you're playing a game where you want to create a safe space, even though you might be going down some darker themes, right? Empower your players to tell you, I'm uncomfortable with this thing that's happening or is about to happen. Can we do it a different way? And it's for you, use your creativity to come at that problem a different way. So as an example, let's say we're in a fight scene and you're really getting into it. Let's say we're playing something like Aliens, one of my favorite movies. And you've, they're playing Space Marines and they're moving through corridors and it's all been spooky and, and things are going on. And then the first alien attacks a player or attacks a bystander and you really start getting into it. You like, you're James Cameron and you're, you're telling it about the camera shot and the lighting and then you're like, and the alien starts tearing it from limb to limb and sinew and, and guts are pouring out and, and of this poor uh, uh, worker that you haven't quite got to. And then somebody at the table says, you're, it feels like you're going a little heavy on the description of the guts and the blood and the tearing of limb to limb. That's kind of making me a little uncomfortable. Can we, what can we, you know... Can we not do that? I want to use my X card. Or I want to say that's making me uncomfortable. It's for you to go and say, okay, that's great. Now when I uh, talk about the alien doing this or that, I can tone down what I'm saying, right? I can say we're not going to do that. Let's say it was something, because I've seen this before, let's, uh, in, in aliens, in the example, you have Newt, right? So let's say in your, in your scenario, the alien captures Newt, the 12-year-old child, that could be a darker subject. And maybe there's people at the table that are not comfortable with a child being harmed in the game. They're not there for that. They might say, whoa, you just said Newt fell through the hole. We can hear aliens down there. I don't know what you're about to explain, but that makes me uncomfortable. That's a child. I'm just here to play a fun role-playing game. I don't like... I, I, that's making me feel uncomfortable. Again, in that situation then instead you can say that Newt doesn't fall down the hole, you can retcon it, you can say if she falls down the hole, you hear some things, but she's okay, move on. The story doesn't need to dwell on those uncomfortable points to make it a good story, right? You can find ways to move around it and not use whatever that piece of somebody being uncomfortable. Uh, you have somebody that's tied up and somebody's uncomfortable with that, don't tie it up. It kind of happened a little bit in our Urban Shadows game. Somebody wanted to play um, a ghost, which we all thought, okay, that's a that's one of the things that you can do, one of the playbooks you can do. And he started to describe um, that he was a ghost from a suicide. And many of the people at the table got a little uncomfortable about how graphic the person was getting, the player was getting. And the players themselves, we talked about it and said, it's cool that you have that character concept in your head. It's fine that that's kind of what you were thinking of, but there are some people at the table that are a little comfortable with that. We don't want to, you know, go down that route too far. And that person was absolutely willing to, to kind of adjust what they were doing with their character so it wasn't so heavy on 
this angle that they had come up that they thought would be a, an interesting angle for the game, but it made other people uncomfortable, okay? So using the X card, you can read about it online. There's other games that talk about it right in their, in their game. If you have Urban Shadows, it talks about it in there. You can find out more information. There's other people that have done other things that are similar. The idea is, is that you have a way to empower your players to say when they're not comfortable or when they are, uh, or when something is making them uncomfortable, and you just move the game away from that because it doesn't have to be about that. You want your game to be about their heroes. You want your game to be about awesome storytelling. You want your game to be about um, climatic moments. It doesn't have to be about those little details that are making somebody uncomfortable. You can just get past those in it. You want to do that in a home campaign, that's fine. You want to do that with friends that you know, that's the perfect time for that stuff. Um, but at a convention game, a lot of times you're not going to know the people at all. So you want to keep it very, very neutral toned for the people that you're playing with. Because you're going to have lots of different age levels. Like at my tables, I had lots of varying age ranges also. Lots of varying... Uh, people of different cultures, lots of varying um, uh, people of orientation. So you, when you're playing those things, focus on what's good about the hero story and not about the other things that might make other people uncomfortable. So I think that's probably good enough on that. I see Jordan stopped in, yep, going solo for uh, for tonight. Uh, hopefully PB will be back soon. Um, she'll get her computer fixed and we can start, uh, she can start doing streaming again and uh, videos and such, but we'll see how that goes. But th thanks for stopping by, Jordan. Um, so those are things that I think if you're going to be prepared for a, a, a convention game, those are the big points that you want to go over. So keep in mind the time frame that you have. Create something that's a little bit on the rails, mostly on the rails, with a few modular pieces that you can put in um, so that you can really control the time and how much things are going on. Be aware of the game that you're playing if you're going to be creating characters or if you're going to already have pre-mades or you're going to have those people show up with characters because that's going to really affect how much time and what you're doing with your session. Um, have a prepared document like the one I showed you. You can even have, uh, yep, she has a broken PC. Um, you can even have little um, cool little guides a lot of games will have is things like the GM sheets. So let me show you the one for masks. Um, so masks has this neat one here. Let me, uh, let's go here. And so this was a GM reference sheet that they that you can get from the um, the web page, Magpie um, Gaming's web page. And this is the stuff that you would need to run masks. So things about um, you know, always say things like this. What are your principles? What are the moves that are happening? Um, these are the types of classes, or these are basically playbooks in this game. Um, what order is the when the team came together? That's an important thing for this game. Not other games, but this one it's important. And then even down further, they have things about here's how character creation happens. Here's some things like some extra names some drives for the villains, villain moves, real names, just conditions and things. So this was a nice little two-page thing to have for me that I kept in front of me that kept me focused, kept me understanding certain rules. I kept looking at it while players were talking. Um, and having something like this set up for whatever game you're playing can help you run the game at the table. If you don't have like a big DM screen that has all that stuff on there, which, you know, a lot of times you won't. Um, so there's a, usually a lot of materials that you can get for the game that you're working with. Have those ready, have those printed out, bring them to the table, highlight the ones that you know you're going to get into in your game, and be ready for that. When designing your adventure, let's say you're not given any of this stuff because the, uh, the people that you're going to be running the games for, maybe you just sign up for yourself. So we'll use the example like at Marmalade Dog, I've signed up for masks and I'm gonna run it myself. It's my own adventure. I'm gonna run the whole thing. I'm gonna set up, I'm gonna use these materials. Now, if I was gonna run, I don't know, let's say Numenera. Numenera, I'm probably gonna set up because creating a character can take a little while in Numenera or even like Dungeons and Dragons, it could take a little while. So what I might have is pre-made characters, uh, which is very common for a convention game where you'll be given a character to play or what will be placed out there is like a group of 10 
and you can pick one of the ten, right? Because that can help get the game kind of moving forward quickly. Um, so that's one way to handle that, have those already prepared and printed out. If the game can make a character in an hour of your session, then get those things that are important for your character creation down to an hour and be good enough that you can teach it to somebody who hasn't done it before for that hour, right? You want to be able to be able to answer those questions. You want to be able to fill it out. So make a couple of those character sheets so that you know how long it's taking you to build that character. Let's go back to our... Uh, have that ready. Have your materials ready at your table. Um, and then planning your session. So have your intro, which is really talking about who you are, what type of game you want to play. Talk about what the game it is that you're going to be playing and sell them on the game, right? So Mass has a really good thing about like paragraphs about what is the Mass game and what type of game is this really meant for. If it's playing uh, Dungeon World or it's playing Numenera or it's playing Star Trek Adventures or it's playing Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, read those, have those block texts that at the beginning of all of those books that says, what is this game about? If, you know, they usually have a paragraph there that says, here's what this game is about. If you like what you just read, then you're at the right game. If you thought it was going to be something else, then maybe this isn't the game that you, you thought it was going to be, right? <clears throat> so if you're playing Dungeons & Dragons and the person sat down and said, wait, we're not getting large robots? Nope, this isn't the system that has large robots. This is the system that does this, and you're reading off that block um, at the very beginning of the session. Uh, you're setting the tone at the beginning of the session. You're letting them know what type of tone of game you're going to be playing. You facilitate them meeting each other at the table. Go around and ask them to introduce themselves and you introduce yourself. Um, talk about character creation or how characters are tied together. Have a conversation or even a few RP scenes where they're allowed to interact to start to bring the, their cohesion together as you begin to build your story. Um, and empower them to tell you when something might be uncomfortable or when it's not going quite the way that they thought and that they are allowed to ask questions or they're allowed to um, ask you to move it in a different direction if needed. Those are all the things that are happening in the very beginning, right? Then hit them with, their, hit them with the story. Hit them with something good and strong right in the beginning. Usually a conflict or a combat Something they can usually easily win, something that allows them to be heroic, something that allows them to say, yes, this is what my character is, and I understand now what they can do, okay? Then allow some transitional scenes that allow them to talk with each other, investigate, um, cautiously move from one area to another, begin to build the mystery of what's going on, begin to fill in information of why we were just in this conflict that just happened to hit us so hard and so fast. Let that build. That's going to be your middle part of your session. And then with the end, build to your climax and then hit them with another good ending scene, another good um, showcase kind of scene at the end that has to do with a big villain, has to do with a, a big battle or a big moment that they're all going to remember and that they're all going to be a part of. And then at the very end of the session, ask them how much fun they had, ask them what they thought about the game, uh, get to know them a little bit, talk to them, tell them where you're from and, and why you're doing stuff. Make that connection with them at the end of the game that's outside of the game so that, that the, the player interaction, not just the character interaction. And I think if you do all those things, if you prep a little bit, you have your materials ready, you have a pretty good understanding that you're going to run a four-hour game that's not really going to need to worry about continuity. It's just going to be for a, a set of random people that are probably new to the game or probably don't know the rules very well. So you're going to be teaching the game as you go. Okay. Uh, one of the things that was really nice in some of the games, like the, the Star Trek game, was set up specifically not only to have a fun Star Trek mission, but it was also structured so that each part taught you how to play the game. So in that one, they structured uh, a scene in the shuttle, 
that the players could interact with each other. This showed them that this was going to be a game about uh, role playing and interaction with other people at the table and that they're a crew. The next piece had to do with they needed to land the shuttle. This showed a very quintessential part of that game, which is a skill check. Okay, So this began to build on how do skills work and how do these things work, and now I'll be able to use those in other areas. The shuttle finally landed. Maybe it crashed. Maybe they were able to set it down using their skills, whatever happened. But they were able to learn how to do a skill check. Then a combat happens, so that they can see the combat mechanics, they can see the, the conflict mechanics uh, of what's happening in the game. And small, targeted, so that it's, it's easy to understand and you get through most of the basic rules that you're gonna need and they can understand that piece. Then the next piece goes into more complicated skill check, which is one that they call a challenge, um, a challenge which has multiple skill checks that need to be happen in a row. For the Star Trek Adventure game. And then they wrapped it up with an ending scene that had to do with tying up the storyline, bringing everything together, skill checks, challenges, and a combat all in one, RPing all throughout that. And by the end of it, you had a very good idea of how to play Star Trek Adventures. You had a very serial like episode of. Uh, uh, you could even think of it as like a TV show episode or a, um, you know, a web series episode of, of one of those um, TV shows. And it felt very Star Trek-like. Everything about it was very Star Trek. And when you walked away from it, you had this good feeling of this is what this game will be about. And if I really like that, then I'm going to go out and get it or I might run it for my friends or whatever. So hopefully... That helps you. I've been talking now almost for an hour, so it's probably time to wrap it up. Hopefully that helps you with running convention games. I hope to do another video or more videos on this, um, and I hope to do it targeted more at specific games. So to have a video about, hey, you're going to run Mass at a convention, here's this. You're going to run Dungeon World at a convention, here's this, or whatever I come up with. I'm hoping to do more of those in the future. Hopefully this one's more generic and helps you no matter which one you're running. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Hopefully we have PB Plays Inside back very soon because we all miss her and it's always better to have somebody that can add in uh, ideas and bounce your ideas off of. So I really hope she gets back soon. Um, and we'll probably have some guest hosts, if not, if that's going to take a little bit longer. But let's go ahead and bring it out. So if you want to contact us again at the show, you can go at Standard Array. If you want to contact me or PB to give us ideas on what other topics we could um, talk about in, in our Sunday evening show, then you can uh, contact me at, at Sir Lucian Gaming, all one word. It's L U C I E N. Or if you want to send something to PB, you can send it to at PB Plays Inside, all one word. And that is her Twitter. You can also check us out. Uh, we both have. Twitch channels and YouTube channels. Obviously, you might be on my Twitch channel right now. You may be watching the VOD on my Twitch channel, or you may be watching this on my YouTube channel, which is also youtube.com slash solution will get you there. Um, you can see the I put up these videos on the next week after, so usually like a Monday or Tuesday. On Wednesdays, I do a rebroadcast of the different shows I'm in. So we have a Saturday morning Dungeons & Dragons show that I'm um, on with uh, Jordan, the PH is silent. And we do that show every Saturday morning. I like to do a rebroadcast of that on Wednesday. You can check that out on Saturday mornings at 12 p.m. We do um, actual plays throughout the week. So we have a Storm King's Thunder Monday night game that you can check out on my Twitch channel here. And that is a 5e you know, full-on module as it's read game. Really good group of people. We've been playing around like episode 55 or 56 at this point. You can jump in anytime. All of the episodes are out on the YouTube if you want to catch up that way. Um, also, we have um, a Tuesday game that I play in on Anaris' Twitch channel. And that one is an Adventure League Tomb of Annihilation. If you want to watch me play Dungeons & Dragons Tomb of Annihilation. PB happens to be in that one also. And then we've already talked about the Saturday night show. You're already here for the Sunday show. So those are the things that I'm doing. That is all of the things that you can catch on um, Twitch and YouTube. And I do want to plug one more thing. We just did yesterday, Saturday morning, 
we did a fantastic interview with Matt Colville um, of at Matt Colville, or you can go to his Twitch channel or his YouTube channel. He makes a ton of great how to run the game Dungeons and Dragons videos. We had a wonderful interview with him yesterday. If you want to check that out, uh, you can go to Jordan's YouTube channel. He's going to go ahead and post it up on YouTube there. You can check it out in the VODs for my channel. And I'm going to rebroadcast that on Wednesday also if you happen to miss it because it was a fantastic interview. We talked about the Kickstarter that he was in. We talked about uh, being a new GM. We talked about just random a few random things in there, but mostly about the Kickstarter. And it was all really good information. It was super fun. So definitely check that out if you get a chance. All right. That is going to be it for the Standard Array. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully we see you next week when we get to do another episode. Maybe PB will be back. Maybe I'll bring in a guest uh, host. If not, we'll see. Maybe you just get more of Lucian talking about whatever subject I come up with. So hopefully you had a great time. Hopefully you will be back for next week. We'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.